Let's start with a simple exercise. Please, anyone who sent an SMS today, raise your right hand. Oh, nice. <laughs> awesome. And now, anyone who sent any message over, say, WhatsApp, please write your other right hand. Much better. <laughs> um, so let's take a DeLorean time machine. I actually brought one with me. I'm not sure if we can all fit inside, but that's definitely a good example of how we can use technology in the modern world. So let's all sit inside and drive back nine years. By that time, I was living in Australia. And if someone asked me, hey, uh, when do you think chat applications will replace SMS as a primary texting tool? I would respond, no, never. It, it cannot happen because telecom companies just won't let it happen. They receive profits from that. They will not let any company to actually uh, just grab that money. Then let's drive two more years forward in 2013. And now it was official. Chat applications have overtaken SMS globally. And there was a very interesting tweet from Neely Cross, who is a, a European Union Digital Agenda Commissioner, that just said, the cash cow is dying. Time for telecoms to wake up and smell the data coffee. Huh, interesting. I would have thought that it would have never happened. But now, let's drive forward back to 2019. Now, we are back, and uh, we know that WhatsApp delivers billions of messages, more than all the telecoms combined. And WhatsApp isn't a telecom company. WhatsApp is a service, and just like New York Times said, it's a service written in exotic Erlang. What is even more exotic, we run 16,000 machines, 16,000 Erlang nodes. I guess that's the largest installation of Erlang in the world, maybe, I don't know, the largest connected installation at least. But I only joined WhatsApp in 2016, early 2016. Before that, I didn't even have an application installed on my phone. In fact, I didn't have uh, iMessage, I didn't have uh, Facebook chat, I didn't have Viber, Telegram, or any other application. Why? Because I had an assumption, something that I accepted without a question. I couldn't imagine telecom companies giving up their money, telecom companies allowing uh, computer companies to overtake them for text messaging. I couldn't imagine myself writing Erlang code. Why would I do that? Because there is so nice C or C++, and if I want some comfort, there is Java, why would I, why would I even want to use Erlang? But that also happened. But I must admit, I took any chance to do some C hacking. Yes, because Erlang virtual machine itself is written in C, and the operating system kernel is all written in C. So whenever I had a chance, I did dive into kernel or beam. Because I was a performance and scalability engineer at WhatsApp, and I had plenty of opportunities to actually do that with C and C++ code. I took advantage of it, and I remember one day I identified a performance regression and issue, and I thought that I narrowed it down to a very tiny function that provided nibbling coding. Though it's basically a translation from a binary byte into ASCII representation. I assumed that our implementation was slow because Erlang is slow, everyone knows that, right? Because the profiler that I used to try uh, that function said, yeah, that, that's, that's slow. We spend a lot of time in that function. And uh, there is uh, a way to make things faster, implement it in C with, instead of Erlang. Because NIF, native inbuilt function written in C, makes it fast. Huh. Interesting. So I did that. I re-implemented that function in C and ran profiler again. Surprisingly, there was some improvement. Answer, uh, but even more surprisingly, the improvement was so tiny that I thought, oh, something is wrong with the profiler. And yes, 
because it is a tracing profiler, fprof. It, it just points a finger at a function that's executed more often than other function. But then what was wrong? Wrong thing was with me. I assumed that Erlang was slow. I assumed that profiler finds slow code, and I assumed that I will write a better function. None of these was true. But OK, I continued. And then there was a third occurrence of a similar, I would say, event. I learned the lesson, though. And next time I tripped over a performance wire, I have been equipped with a tool. If anyone remembers, like several years ago, there was a function in crypto module that was generating random bytes. It wasn't generating secure random bytes. It was just doing just random bytes. And at some point, it has been deprecated. I think it was in 19th release of OTP or, or something. Richard probably remembers. Uh, but it has been deprecated, and one of our engineers added a replacement for it. That function generates uh, just a stream of random bytes, and our developer just basically replaced it with, with a generator that, that takes a stream of random numbers from 0 to 255, which is exactly what a byte is. And the commit message was uh, crypto strong red bytes uses up system entropy and may be slower than desired. And the proposed implementation is an insecure alternative, just like previous red bytes was. And there was a test plan to that commit. Reviewed, hand tested, and it worked as expected. As soon as I did the reality check, just let me spoil the rest of the talk. In our workloads, we often generate four byte random numbers. And fast and insecure random, that's the second one, delivered the insecure part, but it wasn't fast. It actually was twice as slow as the secure one. Again, there were assumptions made and acted upon, but then it was enough. We needed to understand how to make our process better to actually uh, identify these assumptions and don't try to act on these. So after some time, we uh, realized there are like four simple questions or four simple bullet points that we can, can try. It all starts with a simple question. First, does it try to prove it? Erlang is slow. I'm not trying to prove it. So that's an assumption. And the second is, if it, is it possible to reframe this assumption as a question? For example, uh, Telecom companies send text message, but then you can reframe it as, do you have to be a telecom company to deliver text messages? As we know, WhatsApp is not a telecom company. It delivers text messages. And also, uh, the same reasoning led to, I would say, revolution in hospitality industry. Uh, it all started with hotels have rooms, but then do you have to be a hotel to have rooms to share? We all know about Airbnb. And another example, do you know a company that is the largest taxi provider in the world, and that company doesn't own a single cab? I'm using them too. But uh, if it doesn't work, the third thing to try is to reverse the premise. Just a couple of hours ago, Simon told about uh, Diffie and Hellman. Uh, instead of just going the same way and uh, sharing a secret, before the secret conversation, they challenged the assumption that the secret needs to be shared at all. And they came up with a smart algorithm that allows two parties to establish a shared secret over an insecure channel, that room with eavesdroppers. So they challenged, they reversed the original premise that says the key needs to be shared before the conversation. And they came up with a key exchange algorithm. And now in this room, I guess, even this very moment, some phone does that key exchange with some server. But even if that doesn't work, we need to take a step back and look from the outside, get some external perspective on, on, on the thing that we're trying to analyze. And we also need to seek diversity. It's actually interesting that in most cases, diversity is something about fairness, it's about inclusion, about something. But in fact, one of the most important facts about diversity is a different set of assumptions coming from different mentalities. 
So I have a different assumption than, than my colleague from, say, Sweden, or my colleague from some other place, or, or, or even, I don't know. That's, that's why we need to seek diversity, not because it's going to be more fair or less fair. After we identify the assumption, we need to categorize it. And uh, why? I, I will explain later. But first, I need to state that assumptions may be explicit. For example, uh, like an explicit assumption that the function has been removed because, well, yes, it has been removed. And the assumption was directly stated. But some assumptions are implicit. There was an, an implicit assumption that uh, the proposed insecure random code is faster than secure code. What is interesting, that assumption has never been proven. And that's true for both explicit and implicit assumptions. You can either prove or disprove both of these. Uh, some assumptions deal with facts. These are called factual assumptions. And these are like statements, all men are mortal. Yeah, that's true. We don't try to prove it, we know that it's true. Or there is an assumption that crypto rent bytes is deprecated. Yes, it's also true, it has been deprecated. That's a fact, we cannot do anything with it. Yet some assumptions are analytical. Uh, it's uh, interpretation of factual uh, assumptions or it's interpretation of some data or it's some thinking process that creates these assumptions. And yet there is another kind of assumption that's values. A simple example, I value uh, morning running, cycling, jogging, but other people may not. So these are values. I assume that everyone values uh, th those morning routines. Some people don't share that, and, but these are values. Y y the interesting thing about values is either you share values or not. You, you cannot do any logical reasoning about value-based assumptions, unlike factual and analytical. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we have an algorithm to apply. First, we have a, an evidence. And if that evidence is true, and we move correctly in, in our um, uh, process of thinking, then, and only then, the assumption is true. Let's consider a boring example, which is an Erlang distribution cluster. There are lots of assumptions around that. There are assumptions that Erlang cluster is a full mesh network, and the heartbeat and uh, other traffic grows quadratically, and therefore, Cluster size is limited to approximately 50 nodes or around that. Uh, I would say that these assumptions were challenged by a lot of people around. Uh, if you search internet, there are projects that say you don't have to have your Erlang cluster fully mesh connected. For example, Partisan, that is a pretty interesting project. They claim that it's okay to run 10,000 machines in a non-connected mesh. But then we decided to challenge another assumption. Why? Because if you have non-fully connected mesh, you have to uh, deal with the latency of messages routed through different paths. And we decided to challenge a different assumption. The one that says uh, cluster size becomes a bottleneck because of heartbeat and other um, service traffic. So let me quickly remind how uh, WhatsApp uh, looks from Eagle's eye view. So we have a meta cluster, and every meta cluster consists of a few smaller distribution clusters. Basically, front-end machines, so-called chat tier, that's the largest distribution cluster that we have in every geographical region. And just a couple of years ago, these clusters were no larger than approximately 8,000 machines. And we decided to expand one of these clusters to 3,000 machines just to see what happens. And will it actually break it? Will monitoring traffic just flood everything and it, it, it will just stop working? So yes, we just did it. And honestly, there was not as noticeable uh, increase in CPU consumption or network consumption or RAM or, or something like that. But the cluster just didn't want to become healthy. Why? We, we, we quickly found out that the problem was with uh, 
publishing services that these machines provide. We, are, we were still using very heavily modified and even rewritten PG2 module uh, originally provided by OTP. Uh, yes, it, it's, it was completely rewritten. And still, it wasn't enough for us. Uh, we, we still needed something that was basically faster. Uh, we tried even more changes and updates, but that's eventually we failed. So I started looking for other implementations and other libraries to name a few, like React process groups, CPG, S groups, SYN. I think I've looked through everything that was there. And it was crystal clear that we needed really fast registry reads and an ability to survive a storm of updates when there are hundreds of nodes concurrently joining and leaving the cluster. We basically needed a better service discovery. But let's start with what is actually service discovery. Mm. How do we, human, discover services? Let's consider this simple example. I noticed recently that the flux capacitor of this car is misbehaving. So what I do, I look Google, I search for a list of nearby car services, and I find one or several that service specifically these cars. Then I make a few phone calls and find out which service will actually uh, has some availability and which service can actually service this car. And as soon as I get some positive answer, I book an appointment and then I come there and uh, my car gets fixed. Speaking distributed computing, it looks as if I asked a registry, which is Google, for a list of nodes in that car servicing cluster. And then I confirmed with one of the nodes that it still has that service running and I ensured that I got the right partition of the service because the services are partitioned by brand, by a specific operation that they, that, that they do, and only after that I could make an appointment and actually receive the service. This works well for something that I really need, like engine repairs, but it will not work for something that needs a really high volume. Um, for example, uh, let's think of a, I would say, more humoristic thing. I'm at home and I want a cup of coffee. I know that my cupboard provides a service with cups of, well, empty cups at least. How do I know that? Because originally I asked my service locator, that's my wife, <laughs> where is my cup? And she said, yeah, it's in the cupboard. So I remember that position. I know that my cup is in the cupboard. And next time when I open the cupboard and it's not there, I have to go to service locator and ask, hey, where is my cup? And she responds, oh, it's in the dishwasher. Now I know that my cup can be there, here, in the dishwasher or somewhere else, and eventually I form a network between me, dishwasher, cupboard, and so on. And actually I have quite a number of these networks at home. And my entire home forms a huge mesh-connected cluster, just like we have at WhatsApp. Imagine we have a large cluster. It's all mesh-connected, but you don't have to publish your services to all the nodes in that cluster. That's what PG2 does. And this is why we implemented scalable process groups, which exactly solves that problem. We still have a mesh-connected cluster, but now you don't need all nodes to publish all services to all other nodes. You can form several overlay nodes. This is basically how all of the internet works, I think. So you have lots of overlays network, overlay networks over the internet, and it doesn't mean that you need to push your service to every single server in the world. So how far we can get now? Uh, in the current state, we are happy with running like three or even 5,000 nodes in a single distribution cluster. We don't know the exact limits just because we ran out of machines, that's already Quite, quite a number, but the journey isn't finished. Eventually, we will, we will test how it works with 10 or 20 thousands. At the moment, there is no noticeable performance degradation or like there, there are no problems that, that, like, that, that at least I am aware about. But now, let's get to the most interesting part. How did we get there? So what instruments and routines we needed to use to uh, confirm to challenge assumptions and to confirm that we are moving the right way. It always starts with data collection or evidence collection. If we 
suspect that there is something unusual going on, first, we try to collect evidences. We try to prove or allay our fears. To give an example, when we started working on the cluster size problem, first thing we looked at was CPU, network, and RAM consumption. And it turned to be that it wasn't the problem. Even with several thousand nodes in a single cluster, exchanging all the monitoring traffic, we even reduced the tick time, that's how often the nodes send heartbeats to each other, and we ensured that it didn't really bring any significant performance overhead. But then we collected average time to publish the service. In our case, the services were joining PG2 groups, and we were immediately terrified. But at least we found a metric to optimize. While in general, I disagree with the statement, you can't improve what you can't measure. It is so much easier to argue if you have that metric handy. Remember, we categorized assumptions before. So data collection works well against or in favor of factual assumptions. When there is no evidence supporting the assumption, it is quite likely for that assumption to be wrong. Tracing and other observability tools is also a form of evidence collection. It is really fascinating to discover how other people may misuse your APIs and how often the entire system behavior relies on some undocumented side effect. There are static analysis tools. They work well for smaller systems, but for really large systems, tracing gets progressively more important. And uh, then, if tracing uncovers something interesting, next tool that comes into use is code introspection, or read the fascinating source code. How is this API used? Why does this code wait for four seconds before finally unpublishing the service? Hmm. It seems to give some slack to those requests that are in flight, but not much of that slack, only four seconds. Real code, that's a real example, by the way. And I'm sure any large code base contains assumptions like this. Raise hands if you know about any in your code. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, after all, even William Gates III said that 64 kilobytes should be enough for everyone, right? And four seconds definitely should be enough for all requests in flight to finally come up to the service. Uh, sometimes it may be necessary to dive into source code history or perform source code archaeology or even documentation archaeology. It may be quite exciting. Uh, speaking of magic constants and four seconds, I remember a case when I had to bisect the entire code base to find out when that magic value of four seconds was introduced. And of course, the original commit message contained explanation of that peculiar choice. But then that magic value was copied somewhere else, of course, with no credit to the original commit. In many cases, those magic values aren't completely random, or at least they are somehow explained. There may be documentation that you need to dig, or you may find some initial sample that explains the logic behind it. If it's not in your code base, then actually do a search in Google or on Stack Overflow, because it often happens that snippets of code gets copied from the external source, and they end up in your code base without explanations why this specific numbers was selected in the first place. Uh, but then let's dive a little bit into evidence collection. So let's start with logging. Log provides some data from the inside, from from inner guts of your project. And it's different from monitoring, because monitoring provides an external view. Uh, th this is different from, from, from logging, because it does not affect the actual behavior of your system. If you add a logging statement, then the race condition may appear or disappear, or may become less likely or more likely. So these tools, they may seem similar, but they're really different. And tracing, it's something in between of uh, logging and monitoring, because it still sits somewhere inside your software, inside, inside your project, or inside Erlang, or inside virtual machine that you have. So it does affect execution of your program, uh, but still you don't have to explicitly code it. Uh, it's a combination of intrusive and non-intrusive approach. And there are several kinds of tracing that we usually apply. So first is very simple, it's basically 
tracing function calls and collecting arguments that the function has been called with. Uh, this kind of tracing gives you some understanding of w w what's, what's the actual call traces and on what's actually happening in your system. But there is another kind of tracing. Uh, in Erlang it's called sequential tracing. Uh, some other languages and other uh, frameworks call it request tracing. It's, um, that, that sort of tracing follows the message exchange path. It makes it possible to trace all messages resulting from the very original one. For example, you receive an HTTP request and you trace what interactions it creates in your system. Collection of these traces provide visibility into the entire system or even the performance of that system. You are able to see where your request spends the most time and what's, what's the part of the system yet that you should be optimizing. For a single server or a very small cluster, there are tools that are readily available. Uh, for our length, there are libraries like Recon Trace or Redbug for a function level tracing. It's not as a good story for sequential tracing or request tracing. There is early barely tool, but you should not be applying it to the real production system. Why? Because larger installation produce too much data. There are various techniques to shrink the amount of data to analyze, starting with sampling. So basically you may just randomly drop 99% of logging events and just analyze the existing 1%. It doesn't have to be that stupid. You can implement some smarter sampling routine. For example, those events that are happening rarely, you may want to keep them all. Those that are often, you may want to keep some of them. And those that are super frequent, you may just count these events and don't, don't even try to log any information from that specific line of code. But then, after you collected uh, that information, oh, basically, by the way, like, uh, how, how, how do you view that uh, information that you collected? So, since now we are a part of Facebook, we are using internal systems, ODS operational data store and SCUBA, which is in memory statistic storage. But there are other tools available for, uh, like as, as open source projects. For example, before we, joined, before we were acquired by Facebook, we were using Graphite and it was just serving as well. And uh, there are other tools like Prometheus and Grafana, which, which serve just fine for Erlang and not only Erlang. But Erlang has some really good thing about it. It has an ecosystem foundation and there is a, an observability working group that is actually working day and night to provide better tools for you and to, to get some better views on everything. Uh, then for aggregation, there are lots of information on what you may want to aggregate, how you may want to view that. So I will basically defer to any talks about Grafana, Prometheus, and, and similar projects. But what I want to be uh, sure about is that you know about your data retention because it, it should be made very clear for anyone who uses your data how long these data are stored for. There is no simple answer to actually find out uh, how long you should store your data for. Because like every case is different. But in general, there are obvious patterns. For example, there are daily patterns, there are weekly patterns, there may be some other kinds of patterns. And obviously there are exceptions. For example, uh, for the New Year Eve, we want to keep high resolution data for the entire 31st of December and the 1st of January. Why? because it's the only real test of WhatsApp reliability and WhatsApp throughput. Like people do really crazy things during New Year. It's not even Christmas when magic happens, it's the New Year. Um, and why this retention policies needs to be made very clear? Mm, I have a good example. Oh, what's, what's wrong with our request rate? It's very spiky, it jumps up and down, it's trembling and shaking. And it's, it's, it's rather a new thing. It has not been happening before. That was one of the engineers that asked the question. And uh, I asked, why do you think it has not been happening before? Oh, because I took the same graph from three weeks ago and it was super smooth. There was no jumps or spikes. Hmm, what is our retention period? And of course that was two weeks. After two weeks, graphs were magically getting really smooth. 
All right, but sometimes it's not possible to collect data from actual running production system because either it does not um, provide the necessary mechanisms or uh, it does not provide a repeatability of this measurement. And in that case, we need to implement benchmarks. We need to uh, add we need to add that benchmarking to our evidence collection toolbox. I only wish that we had utilities like Earl Perf like several years ago. That would have saved us some amount of time over heated debates over is this Erlang construct faster than that one? Now we just have a tool to quickly verify, okay, run this, run this, okay, that one is faster, let's go with that one. Benchmark is an essential part of a toolbox when it comes to factual or analytical assumptions. And uh, now that we are equipped, oh yes, one more thing that I almost forgot to tell. Uh, what tools are there in Erlang? Uh, in many other languages, there are a multitude of tools, but unfortunately not for Elixir or Erlang or similar languages. So we use ad hoc runs, and for that we use Erlperf. And uh, it's a very simple tool. It just basically tells you which version of code is faster than the other one, or you can feed it the code and it will say if this code is concurrent and how concurrent that is. It just adds worker threads, worker processes that execute the same code and, and when adding a next worker doesn't really bring any throughput advantages, then it says, okay, this is concurrent up to two processes. Uh, what's the problem with ad hoc runs? If it's done once, it is forgotten later. If we need to keep the assumption true for a longer period of time, benchmarking must be automated. For example, it can be added in, as, a, as, as a test case for one of the test suites. And then it will be run on a periodic basis. If you run your uh, test suites every time you uh, push some change to repository, then it will run every time, uh, then that benchmark will be run every time. If you only have a continuous integration that runs your benchmarks once a day or once a night, then it will, at least you will get some periodic signals. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes it just doesn't cover all possible inputs because the traffic patterns are changing. Test case that was written in 2011 mostly cared about text messaging and it just didn't take into account voice calls or picture uploads or anything like that. And uh, it's difficult to pick between repeatability of the test, we want to be repeatable, and uh, actual representation of the world because we want to follow the actual traffic patterns. In that case, pick both and implement two cases. <clears throat> now that we collected enough data, it should be reasonably easy to perform root cause analysis to find and pinpoint the actual problem. You can draw a diagram just like this. This is a simplified version of it. <clears throat> How does it work? We start with the apparent problem. Our cluster takes too long to restart. So there may be several causes that actually the issue. It could be network connectivity because of your CPU consumption or network latency. Or it could be something else, something else, something else, but we found out that there was service discovery that was taking time because we had data. And again, service discovery may be slow because of this, 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 and this, but in the end we found out that it was publishing the service that was keeping our service down in unhealthy state. So root cause analysis diagram provides a good visualization of this process and really helps to challenge some less obvious assumptions, like analytical assumptions mostly. And uh, in some cases, it's really safe to assume we are not the first to deal with a specific problem, even though we may want to think otherwise, but in reality, there are always multiple alternatives. Learning several alternatives is often an eye-opener. It helps to deal with all kinds of assumptions, be it factual, analytical, or even value-based assumptions. After looking around, it's often found that we are trying to reinvent a wheel or a bicycle. But if not, and if we are operating in a different set of constraints, 
that does not let us to reuse any existing solution. Uh, we need to build a prototype. That's the next logical step. Prototypes start with a proof of concept and then in transition into a standalone system that runs along with the original one. In, we, we call it a shadow mode. And then we compare results between these two. At some point when we decide that a prototype is mature enough, we switch it into a master mode and the prototype becomes a source of truth. And, but we still run the original system to verify that they both produce the same results. And only after we are really sure that the prototype is better, only that, then we switch off the, the, the old system, now it's old, and then we try to clean it up because it's something that's, that's a lot more difficult than introducing a new system. But what's the most important property of any tool or routine? It is discoverability. How do we ensure that another person makes the same assumption that we made? How do we know that our assumptions stand true after a year, two years, or maybe in a different environment or even in a different company? My answer is try writing more tests for that. Codify your assumptions. Make it really discoverable through testing. Applied to computer system, most factual assumptions can be translated in some so, into some sort of an automated test. So documentation is easy to miss. And the broken test, it immediately pops at you. But don't make it overly annoying. If your test case breaks every time there is a, like a really unrelated change in your database, and you only want the test to break so a person understands your assumptions, it, it's not it's not the right way to do. At least I found out. <clears throat> Most tools I mentioned before, they deal with uh, factual and analytical assumptions. But approaching value-based assumptions isn't that straightforward. It's not enough to have the set of tools and routines and processes. We're all human beings. We have our biases. It is essential to recognize these biases and at least try to avoid logical fallacies. It's a huge topic on its own. I'm not going to uh, even try going through that topic. And uh, I will just mention one resource, the School of Thought, primarily for their sense of humor. They're really humoristic. And also uh, for their very extensive lists of cognitive biases and logical fallacies. Both lists contain 24 items. And I'm not going to go through all of them. But remember that I said always collect data. And I collected some data. I logged and counted evidences and performed some really basic frequency analysis. And I came up to these seven statements that, and so, or seven assumptions that appear with really high frequency. Let's call it a fallacy bingo statement. If anyone remembers himself or herself making all of these statements in one argument, you can claim a victory. First one sounds innocent. It worked before, therefore, it will work in the future. I must admit, I've been using that as well. But there is a simple way to actually challenge that assumption. It, it's an example of confirmation bias. And uh, it's easy to break it down with questions like, did it really work? Did it work for us? Is it still working? Do we have any evidence that it's still working and it, and it really worked that way? In most cases, the answer will be, oh, we have anecdotal evidences. We, the, the production system has been running for some time, but that doesn't mean this assumption stands true. But the second one is interesting. The system failed after that change. So let's revert the change and the system will recover. No, that doesn't work. Time can never go back. Reverting a change means just another change applied on top of already running system, especially in a distributed system, that's, that's really bad sometimes. So it may even make situation worse, especially if there is some state that is stored in your system, and in most cases it is. Or if you change some data format and then you are reverting that, it, it never goes well. So challenge that assumption as soon as you see it. But then the next statement is even more interesting. Our system is complex, and therefore it's difficult to operate our system. That's called a complexity bias, and it isn't really something new. We humans often find it easier to face the complex problem rather than a simple one. 
Life is really simple. We insist on making it complicated. That's Confucius, that's, that's not me. <laughs> what, what it means, we haven't paid enough attention to make a proper design, to design a system that is simple and easy to operate. Try to detect that kind of complexity, unnecessary complexity, and prefer simplicity of your system. So it doesn't need to be difficult to operate. But how to do that? Oh, the simple solution, okay, let's add an, a layer of abstraction, and that will hide underlying complexity. Resulting, well, we have a spaghetti, and now to hide the underlying complexity, we want to cover it with a sheet of lasagna, and then think that the resulting dish is lasagna. No, it's still spaghetti, just now covered with lasagna. What, isn't it what tech giants do? And it worked for company name, then it would work for us. Well, look at Google Graveyard. There are approximately 200 abandoned projects, quite big projects, and counting. So try to make sure that your short-term decision will not lead into that trap, and you will not just have to shut the project down because you cannot deal with the increasing complexity. But that raises the next question. Should we hack quickly something to unblock some other work and later return with a better design? Oh yes, absolutely. When there is a fire and timer is running out, yes, of course. But not yet. If you are hacking to unblock and planning to provide a better design later, remember, always remember to Always remember of a post-completion error. That's, that's the scientific name of this thing. The subtask that is carried out after completion of the main task is likely to be missed. Ensure to set up follow-ups and reminders. Otherwise, you'll be driving with the gas nozzle sticking from your car. Remember to re-evaluate re design decisions made in the past. And remember to recognize those teams or those people who actually cleaned up the mess after generations and generations of spaghetti code. Because making post-completion error, it's easy. We just, we will provide consistent API somewhere later after we complete the migration. No, it's not easy. To really achieve that, a person must be the artist who challenges all kinds of assumptions. And just to challenge one more, what do you know about Australia? It's really hot, right? It's a tropical continent, blazing sun, red desert, right? Crocodile dandy, no? Oh. <laughs> now I'm ready to answer your questions. Any questions? Uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Uh, first of all, is that a uh, zoo in Canada by any chance? Just to challenge that assumption. No, that's actually Australia. That's a photo I made. Oh, wow. I'm from Australia. <laughs> um, uh, I was uh, wondering about the uh, initial uh, example you had of the, the pull request um, where somebody had used what turned out to be a slower method. Um, do you have any system of reminding people when such an issue was found and it was corrected? Um, so for example, uh, if you decide, okay, we're going to do this thing in a certain way because this is the best way of doing it, how do you avoid that sort of information getting lost after a few months when people have forgotten about it? Okay, as I said, if you really want to ensure that some information isn't getting lost, you need to, to make it really discoverable. And one of, the makes to, one of the ways to make it discoverable is to write a test for it. So after some time, if the test fails because of some, something, something has changed, then you get a pretty good signal that, okay, this is not, not, not the right way to do it. This is something that has changed. But there are different ways to do reminders. Uh, like There are so many ways to nag a person. I guess you have some sort of a um, like bug tracker or something similar. 
all companies have now something similar. You can just set up a reminder and just send a message or send a calendar event, for example, in three months to say, okay, three months have passed, now please tend to that issue that we, uh, or set up a deadline for that issue, or maybe remind it in a week or so. Just, it, this has to be discoverable. If it's something that's really necessary to fix, it's, it's something that's valuable, then it has to pop at you. Not necessarily you, someone who is interested in fixing the problem. Any more questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Have you found any way to sort of automate those seven flags you have there? Any way to sort of like help you remind yourself of those very assumptions in an automatic way? Not yet, not yet. I don't really think it's possible to automate the human interactions because these assumptions, they basically come up during some of these design reviews or discussions when, uh, mostly priority discussions. Should we do this now? Should we do this later? And if we do this later, then the post-completion error actually pops. If we do it later, we need to set up a reminder now because if we don't set it up, it will be forgotten. All right, I think that has to be enough for now. Uh, you can grab Maxim later during lunch. Thank you. <laughs>